thanks for inviting me, Harsha. So uh, I am uh, Darshan Kasturatna. I'm currently working as a um, um, uh, assistant professor at uh, Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology. So, um, so I thought of talking about uh, this topic because I have had some exposure to it. Uh, so it will be a very informal uh, kind of introduction and we'll see some uh, applications of it in, in technology and uh, even uh, understanding some of the current uh, uh, Phenomena. I think we can we can make some use of it. So uh, so we'll see what game theory is and um, and then we'll look at some of the uh, relevant applications. I most of the uh, audience is uh, from a technology background. I I, I uh, assume. Uh, anyway, I'll I'll try to keep it as general as possible. So, uh, so let's get into it. So, uh, by the way, uh, yeah, I think we will we'll get into it. So, basically, when you hear the term game theory now, even though the phrase game is used uh, there, it's not really about uh, computer games or anything uh, specifically, but of course, you can apply game theory in computer games as well. So basically, it's, um, it's about uh, strategic decision making. Now, this term strategic decisions might mean different things in different contexts or different uh, fields. Uh, so in the field of game theory, it particularly means uh, decisions that you um, the decisions that you make uh, and uh, when when those decisions are affected by uh, by other people's decisions, right? Uh, then you typically call it a strategic decision. So actually, almost all decisions that we make are affected by what other people do uh, either wittingly or unwittingly uh, you know when you join this particular company that decision uh, may have been affected by uh, some other person's decision i mean at least your employer or it could be someone who uh, decided to apply for that company and didn't join so there could be like unknown decisions as well that may have affected that decision, right? And if you take a very simple decision, like when you are going out, whether to take the umbrella or not, so that that might not seem like a strategic decision because you are just you are just um, you know taking that decision on your own. Uh, but still, if you think about it, if you think uh, the nature as your opponent, then again uh, you can think of it as a strategic decision. So you are. Yeah, kind of engaging in a game uh, uh, with the nature. So, so that's where this term game comes in, I think. Uh, so it's kind of a very uh, competitive, uh, maybe it's a competitive view of uh, existence of the world. But anyway, that, that's the uh, key idea that we are. Uh, so if you think of things that we do, the decisions that we make, uh, uh, either we are engaging in a game with with the others right with other humans other animals and other beings or it could be uh, inanimate objects could be the nature and uh, everybody is just trying to maximize their return uh, over time right uh, maximize their payoff so payoff is the technical term that is used um, so that you can think of everything as a game in, in life I mean, the entire existence is like a strategic game. So that's like a broad idea. And uh, so this particular uh, as, as a uh, area of uh, uh, as a scientific uh, theory, I think it, uh, it arose in uh, yeah, if you have any questions, you can you can either uh, you can e either um, uh, just uh, just speak up i think if you can or you can uh, you can uh, uh, put up those questions in the chat window so it originated in the area of microeconomics i mean formally we can identify it being uh, as part of microeconomics so microeconomics is a branch of economics where you talk about uh, interactions 
between uh, two or three individuals like micro level interactions the other uh, major aspect of economics is macroeconomics where they talk about economic policies and things like gdp and so on inflation and so on so microeconomics is where you look at uh, individual level interactions these individuals could be even countries but it's always interactions between two or three uh, entities right now even though it uh, it uh, you know uh, develop as a subfield of microeconomics uh, um, so it's, it's kind of a uh, um, if you think about it most of the uh, because game theory uses a lot of uh, mathematics statistics and other forms of mathematics um, if you look at most of the math that we use most of it i think uh, may have uh, may have been developed in, as part of physics or, or may have been applied first in in physics uh in classical mechanics or other kinds of physics later on they they get adapted to other other areas but a uh, game theory is uh, i think it, you can call it in humanities so traditionally you think economics as part of humanities even though there's a very mathematical branch of economics so later on uh, this uh, idea this uh, this way of thinking uh, uh, was adapted in other fields like political science uh, psychology education because in any uh, in any domain you can uh, see these strategic interactions right uh, agents individual agents interacting with each other and they are trying to you know maximize their benefit or return so you would want to ideally model such scenarios and maybe do some predictions and maybe you want to develop uh, an autonomous agent where yeah, it will automatically be able to make those um, decisions, autonomous decisions, or you might just want to understand a certain scenario and and uh, you know explain a certain scenario in a formal way, uh, like a political situation or something. So, uh, so because of that, it has become very popular or widely adopted. Maybe, uh, yeah, it's it's very widely adopted in 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 a large uh, in numerous fields i think biology psychology for example so that's why i think it has some um, uh, you know recognition uh, game theory has a very uh, a useful way of thinking although it can be sometimes i think overrated as well so uh, now there's a particular intersection of game theory if you are particularly from a it or a technology background there's there's a, a field called algorithmic game theory or computational game theory where because when when this uh, field developed so i think you could say it's almost 100 years old now uh, in the formal sense so initially there were no computers so but still people could do this modeling uh, by writing them in the paper and doing calculations but with the advent of computers so you could make a lot of you know uh, uh, make uh, do these computations really fast and uh, and because of that most of these model models now we can um, uh, implement in a, in, a, in an algorithm and running a computer and so so that's that's that particular branch when you uh, when you couple computer science and game theory and there there are some applications in computer science where you have you can apply game theory as well so we'll look at some applications uh, later so so that's a big bit of uh, background so if, if it is uh, okay i think if you are, if you have any questions just let me know um so that's the broad idea uh, so if you if you go into the uh, history uh, so this may be um, at least in the western world uh, this may be the uh, I would say uh, we can we can say an earl earliest example of an application of game theory, although it was not called uh, game theory, but back then there was no no such uh, understanding. Uh, so this person, uh, Blaise Pascal, you may have heard of him. 
so these famous uh, popular programming language that was uh, i guess popular in 70s and so on pascal is is named after him so he was a uh, french mathematician who lived in the 17th century i think early part of the 17th century and uh, so he was a pioneer in a lot of uh, mathematical uh, developments as well as philosophy and so on and and he was also a religious uh, man uh, i guess most of the early scientists and mathematicians were religious people so uh, so he had this uh, idea where whether you can come up with some kind of a uh, mathematical argument to prove the existence of god or at least to not to prove really uh, to uh, uh, to check whether it's rational right whether it's rational or wise to believe in god because i guess at that time maybe there was a so there's just after the renaissance and maybe an atheistic movement was growing or humanistic movement was uh, emerging in europe and uh, maybe there was a like a, a religious or a philosophical clash that he felt at the time because he was from a religious background and uh, and he wanted to uh, come up with a rational argument uh, to to show that it's more rational uh, to believe in in a in a creator right so this is what you call so he didn't uh, he may not have come up with this kind of a, a matrix but we can uh, formulate his idea using this matrix so and game theory these are called this uh, what you call a payoff matrix yeah uh, so you have what you call strategies right so you have uh, say two players one player is on the uh, the uh, on this side you have one player on this side you have one, another player so here it's like a, you are going uh, yeah playing a game with the reality or nature um either you believe or disbelieve in god so that's uh, these are the two strategies that you have and um, and the nature or reality has two strategies either god exists or god does not exist right? so we, if so then for each combination we can think of a return or a payoff if after the, after you die perhaps uh, if you believe in god and if god exists then then it's really good right you will be in paradise forever at least in the um, christian theology you will be in a heaven forever so that's infinitely good if you believe in god and if god does not exist uh, so so this is after you die right after you die it doesn't make any difference of okay you believed in god god but uh, you died and uh, there was there's no god so worst case is you are not getting anything in return you are not getting any gain or you are you don't uh, lose anything as well of course you may have lost some things you may have lost some uh, given up some worldly pleasures in your worldly life but that's gone so this is after you die uh, and if you don't believe in god and if god exists so you discover that there's god uh you know then it's bad right then you will be in uh, in burning in eternal hellfire so that's infinitely bad um and if you disbelieve in god and if god does not exist again it's there's no benefit or there's no because after you die there's nothing to prove or anything so there's no gain or there's no loss so so if you look at this uh what's the what's the rational thing to do if you think of this um this pair of metrics can any idea by the way pascal the wager is is the i guess the formal word used for bet right this is like pascal's bet pascal i think it's the correct uh, pronunciation uh, can uh, can anyone suggest what's the rational thing to do here be based on this pair of metrics believe in god 
sorry uh, is it believe in god like yeah, yeah. A... i mean because the worst case is you don't get any return right you are uh, that's the worst case but here the best case is you okay you, there's nothing uh, but uh, if you are wrong you are you are um, you know it's very bad uh, now that is if you look at the world in this binary form that either god exists or just god does not exist so um, i think some of you may be uh, you know uh, buddhist i guess uh, i i i think so now if uh, now if you are following any any abrahamic religion i think this would make sense for a christian catholic or a muslim or uh, islam if you follow islam but if you are a buddhist so uh, can, can anyone think of uh, how this matrix can be changed so of course you can uh, you can uh, rather than saying god you can say afterlife or reincarnation or karma exists and this is uh, those things are not there reincarnation or rebirth or karma is not there believe and disbelieve so if we replace god with karma or uh, rebirth or things like that uh, how about the payoffs how would the payoffs uh, be different Will it be infinity or? Will the payoff be any different? So these are called payoffs, right? This is uh, the return that you need. It would not be really infinite. I mean, if according to Buddhism, it won't be infinite at least because it will be some real number because even if you don't, if you believe in karma, but if you do all the bad things, uh, you know, the actual return might be depending on, it will be a very subjective value at least. So here, this is objective value that is common to everyone. Uh, but if you apply it to a Buddhist context, this will be uh, some real number and that real number will be different for each and every person based on their deeds. So that's just a side note. So I, I just, this helps us to just understand the idea. and. And the key idea that he, he, he wanted to show was that, uh, so even if there's no God, even if there's no afterlife or anything like that, it's more rational to live uh, assuming that there's one. That's, I think, his, his argument. Uh, we don't know for sure, but it's more rational to, um, it may be more rational to live assuming that there's one. But you can also always bring a counter argument, okay, we we'll, we we'll lose some fun now because we have to, you know, if we assume that we have to refrain from doing certain things. So that's the counter argument, I guess. And if, if you lose all that fun after you die, it's too late. I mean, because if there's no good, then you, know, you can't go back because you're already dead. So, so there's a counter argument like that. Anyway, that's just a historical example. By the way, that in, at that time, uh, uh, it was not called game theory. So the uh, modern game theory, I think earliest example that we can find is it's coming from uh, one Newman who is a Hungarian and a Hungarian American mathematician uh, and a maybe the uh, it's called father of computing. Uh, so he came up with this idea called minimax theorem or minimax algorithm, where uh, so you may have studied this uh, those who have studied computer science so. Uh, IT, perhaps uh, when you are uh, in, in uh, traditional AI courses, you typically have this problem where you try to construct this game tree. So this is for like actual games. You can try this for chess and checker, things like that, board games. You would construct a game tree and and minimax means it's, so it's what you call a zero sum game. That is your gain is uh, equivalent to uh, the opponent's loss. So there's no cumulative benefit to it anyway. And, uh, and you, you would expand the game tree. So if it is a, uh, if, if these are states of a chess, chess uh, board, depending on different moves, you, you can expand that to a tree, right? You can have, you can have a very large tree of all the possible states. If you take a, so it's a, it's a sequential game. You take a certain action, 
then the opponent takes action, then you take another action. Right? So what you want to do is typically you want to uh, maximize your benefit and minimize the opponent's benefit. And then once you construct the tree, you would apply some kind of a searching algorithm, uh, depth first or breadth first search or something, and try to select the path that is that minimizes uh, the opponent's payoff and maximizes your payoff. And uh, then you take the move. Right? So uh, now if you have used these uh, electronic chess boards, uh, when you, you have this, this uh, difficulty level, right? When you increase the difficulty level, that will uh, it will take longer to compute because it's, it has to it has to consider uh, a tree that is, that is more uh, deep, right? Um, has more levels, so it takes longer to search the optimum uh, optimum uh, path. So by changing the level of by changing the uh, depth of the tree, you basically you can change the level of difficulty of the game. Uh, of the uh, level of yeah, so uh, that's that's uh, uh, early earliest examples of game theory. So minimax theorem can be applied to such zero sum games. Uh, so that was proposed by von Neumann, I think, in nineteen uh, early early part of the twentieth century, maybe nineteen twenties or thirties. And uh, but, but the the game theory, as we know, was pioneered by a person called uh, John Nash. You may have seen this movie, uh, a Beautiful Mind, starting, uh, starring uh, Russell Crowe. So that's loosely based on his life. Uh, I, I read somewhere that he, he so in the movie they, and he, he has this uh, uh, this illness. I can't remember the name of that illness, schizophrenic or something. Yeah, he he can. Uh, he, he used to, so in the movie, they depict that he can see imaginary characters, but in the actual sense, I think he, he heard things. So, um, so anyway, um, so he came up with this idea called Nash equilibrium, which is uh, one of the uh, uh, foundational uh, concepts in game theory. Still, it's, it's widely used. Um, and uh, he, he used some other theorem, I think, called fixed point theorem or something in, in, in algebra to prove that. So what, what basically it says is, uh, it basically says is that uh, in any strategic decision, in strategic decision making scenario, he, he uh, proved that there, there is at least uh, one or more, there is at least one equilibrium, right? So equilibrium is where nobody is benefiting from deviating from that, that state. Uh, so we can intuitively see that, right? I mean, so if you are employed in, in this, this particular company or any other company, uh, you are in an equilibrium. So uh, you might not be really happy with your position, but still you feel that if you make a move, if you change that situation, you are worse off, right? So your employer also might think like that. They might think, okay, this person is not working very well, but still like, if I fire him or her, it, it's... Uh, it's worse for me, so so they are keeping you. So you are like in equilibrium, right? There can be other equilibria as well. If you think of any any human interaction, like a, a marriage, even so, most people, I guess, who are married, I don't know, at least some percentage of people might think, okay, I'm not really happy, but um, but it's it's better than uh, getting divorced or being single. Uh, so yeah, they are in equilibrium, right? Because they are they are kind of stuck in that equilibrium. So that's intuitively we can see that. Uh, but he, uh, what he did was he uh, proved that uh, that's the case in, in any strategic decision making scenario. There is at least one equilibrium. There can be multiple equilibrium. So, um, so we'll see an example to understand this. So uh, now this. Uh, these games or strategic decision making scenarios we can uh, we can define our own i mean we can uh, define our own games to explain a certain scenarios but there are some classical or well known uh, scenarios that people have defined uh, there are many different games uh, so this prisoner's dilemma is a very popular or widely used 
a game so a game in the sense it it tries to model a certain scenario so this the the back story for this is uh, why is called prisoner's dilemma so so assume that uh, there are uh, two prisoners or, or maybe we i think the proper word should be suspects so these two suspects maybe they have uh, they have done some crime some bank robbery or something like that but there's no real evidence so the the police has a hunch that these these people have done this crime so i mean you may have seen in these movies uh, american movies and things like that now in, in sri lanka of course they they might uh, you know uh, hit the prisoners or torture them or whatever until until they admit their guilt but if you assume that all those things are not allowed so the police have to go by the evidence somehow or they need some confession so what you do is you keep this you may have seen this in some detective movies they keep the two uh, suspects in two different rooms so they can't talk to each other and uh, and then they they would say that okay the other pe other person has betrayed you you know they they have uh, they have given all the details about you so they want to they want a lesser punishment so they have uh, they you have they have uh rat rat you out or something and you'd say the same thing to the other person as well right so ideally you want both parties to confess you know uh, give up the other person and then you have evidence against both right but at least you have evidence against one person if at least one person can the weaker person confesses if both people are, are really trustworthy of each other they, they, they really believe that the other person will not uh, betray them both of them won't uh, confess uh, that then police does not have anything any any tangible evidence so they may have to let them go or the uh, court may give, give them a lesser punishment because there's no real hard evidence so this is the scenario so we have two prisoners prisoner a prisoner b um and the prisoner a has two has two strategies two options either they can remain silent or confess prisoner b also has the um, same uh, two strategies if both of them confess they get both of them will get higher sentences right so that's that's bad if one person remains silent and the other person confesses so the one who confesses usually becomes what you call a state witness right that that person becomes a witness of the state and you know you testify against your um uh you know your partner or uh, the the um, other person that you are uh, engaged you you engaged uh, in the crime with but the other person will have to uh, have a uh, large sentence right so same way here uh, if prisoner a is uh, is uh, silent he will get get a large sentence uh, but the other person uh, will uh, go free if both both of them uh, remain silent then that's the ideal situation from from their point of view at least because um, you know they will they will not get uh they both of them will get a very small sentence right so uh now by looking at this can you guess what, what uh can you guess the uh, nash equilibrium of course there, there 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 is a more formal way to compute the nash equilibrium by writing some set of equations but just by looking at this was uh, can anyone guess the nash equilibrium So Nash equilibrium is the state where, when you are in that state, for either party, it's not beneficial to uh, deviate, deviate their strategy. So if we say this is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, what's the Nash equilibrium state? Yeah, there's an answer saying confess by both. Now, if you take this particular state. uh that is not really nash equilibrium because at this stage 
it's for prisoner B if they move to this strategy. Uh, sorry, prisoner A, uh, if they move to this strategy, if both confess, so that's the Nash equilibrium because for either party, if, if they move to the, uh, uh, if they change the strategy, it's worse for them, right? It's worse. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's not the optimum optimum uh, state, right? The optimum state is this one. So, uh, so just because a state is a Nash equilibrium, it does not mean that um, is the optimum. That's why it's called a dilemma. So prisoners are in a dilemma because if they confess, they reach the Nash equilibrium if both parties can confess, but that's not the optimal optimal state. So that's the idea. Now, this kind of, uh, so this is a nice story, but we can use this uh, idea to model some of, or understand at least some of the things that are happening in the real world. For example, this has been used uh, to understand, to explain uh, what happened during Cold War between, uh, because the key thing about the two prisoners is there's no flow of information, right? We don't know what the one person does not know the other person is doing. So there's always this uh, guesswork. Uh, uh, this has been used to explain uh, in, in uh, international politics, for example, uh, when uh, the US and uh, Soviet Union was there. So there was a Cold War and uh, and why, why this Cold War was there, I mean, never really get into got into an actual war like for maybe uh, over 40 years maybe so because each party were kind of in an equilibrium right? uh, and prisoner's dilemma game has been used to explain why that happened or in in more recent past or in the current situation uh, there's this uh, notion of climate change or global warming and uh, you know the established understanding is that CO2 emissions are contributing to that. But uh, if one country contributes to that, I mean, they, they, they cut down all their industries and all that, that will, that will harm their economy. And because of that, like all countries are kind of stuck in equilibrium, right? So it's like, it's like this mutual defect, defective version. So like that, uh, this can be used to explain some real world scenarios. Uh, so this is what you call, uh, so I'm just explaining some of the background information regarding game theory before we actually move on to how this can be applied in technological, uh, uh, in, in technology. So th this is what you call a pure strategies where you, you create, you select a strategy, either one or zero, right? It's a very deterministic way, but in a real world, you may have mixed strategies. That is, you may have a probability distribution. In most scenarios, I think in, in the real world decision making, you don't know for sure. So you have this amount of probability for taking one dish, one strategy and uh, another like one minus that amount of probability uh, for, for taking another decision. So these are called mixed strategies. And there's an extension of Nash equilibrium because Nash originally uh, defined this for pure strategies, but Later on, I think he extended that to mixed strategies as well. So then you would you would have a, at the equilibrium you will have a probability distribution at each for each player. Um, and there's uh, there's another uh, extension of this. So in prisoner's dilemma, you don't really consider time because you don't really know when the other party is going to make the decision. Uh, so that's called a normal form game. Uh, and there's something called extensive form games where you have a time sequence. So like even in this minimax, you have one player taking addition, then only the other, other player takes addition. Like person. those are called extensive form games where you have this kind of a game uh, tree or like a time sequence. Uh, and uh, one limitation of Nash equilibrium is that so this is relevant to why game theory is applied in technology is this idea that uh, Nash equilibrium is defined for rational, completely rational entities or agents. That is you, you assume that each agent has all the information uh, that is necessary to make a decision 
all the time in the world to make compute that decision. They don't have any limitations in the cognitive capacity or the level of intelligence and so on. But if you think of humans, I mean, humans may have these things in varying degrees. So because of that, if you, uh, if you uh, try to apply game theory or Nash equilibrium particularly to a population of humans, it does not really work. I mean, people will deviate from what Nash equilibrium says. Uh, so, for example, in here, maybe both parties will not uh, confess or one person may remain silent because they have other things like emotions, trust and so on. So they are not always completely self-interested. And if you think being self-interested is the rational, rational thing to do, then, of course, then uh, humans are not completely rational. Right? Um, so that's this idea of bounded rationality that. Uh, that maybe not all humans or all agents, an agent could be a robot or animal or any, any sentient being, uh, is not completely rational. They may not even have all the information necessary to make a decision. So sometimes all of the time we make decisions based on uh, limited information, right? Partial information. So there are other, other kind of equilibria that is you know, models for equilibria that have been developed to... Uh, account for this as well. But this is one key reason why Nash equilibrium might not work uh, as expected among humans. And But when it comes to technology or like when you apply game theory to, uh, you know, uh, computers and so on, sometimes it might work better because that things are more predictable in that, uh, in that context, right? So because of that, I think even though game theory originated as part of humanities, it may have uh, more applications, more kind of reliable and uh, dependable applications in, in other domains, in, in the technical domains and so on. Uh, okay, this is another aspect of uh, games where you, you have iterated or repeated games. So even the prisoner's dilemma game, if you repeat multiple times, then, then you might, uh, get to know your opponent better, your, uh, then you might make more rational decisions, right? Uh, so that is, rationality may improve over time. So, so there's a, you can think of games as iterative games as well. Um, and this is another, uh, so I will, I will briefly discuss some other concepts in game theory. Um, the idea of price of anarchy. So that's another key idea in game theory that is uh, so if if in a in a population or uh, if uh, in a particular game theoretic setting if everyone acts in a completely uh, self-interested manner uh, your optimal your cumulative payoff right your cumulative return might be not be very good right? so a good example of this is traffic right so if you look at, uh, I mean, typically in, in Sri Lanka, we don't, uh, we don't generally have good, uh, people don't generally follow traffic rules that well. So that is because everyone is kind of, they have, they have their own self-interest and they might not uh, follow the given, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the design that is uh, high level design or the high level uh, uh, set of strategies that have been placed there, right? So the centralized set of strategies. So they may be, so there's like anarchy or close to anarchy. Then there's a certain price that you have to pay as a society or uh, as a uh, group. So that ratio between that optimal solution, globally optimal solution, and that uh, anarch, uh, that uh, the, the return at that, when, when everyone is completely self-interested that when, I, when you have an anarchy, so that ratio is called price of energy. So these are the two, uh, I guess, the two um, boundary conditions that game theorists are interested in in a particular scenario. They are interested in the Nash equilibrium and the price of energy. Then you can you can pretty much uh, identify the boundary conditions of any uh, any situation, any strategic decision making uh, situation. Right? And there's another aspect of uh, games. So typically, traditionally, these were used to uh, used in uh, 
two or three player games where you you have two or three players but later on uh, the idea of strategic games have been expanded to networks so populations of players so then you have to think of the topology and there can be many equilibria and things become more complex this as uh, uh, you might not be able to analytically solve all the equilibria and, and all that so those limitations are there and these are interesting uh, subfield or uh, I mentioned that when game theory gets adapted to different domains so you you have certain subfields emerging so there's an idea of, this is an area called uh, evolutionary games or evolutionary game theory where uh, this idea of strategic games are applied to biology right? evolutionary biology to explain how certain populations of species evolve or how they manage to be in a particular equilibrium and so on so this person called a scientist called uh, uh, john maynard smith he's considered the pioneer of this uh, field and this particular game uh, for this particular lizard uh, i think i'll um, briefly explain it uh hope you can see the screen so so we can get an idea how evolution game theory uh, is uh, can be used to explain a certain scenario uh, yeah so there's this uh lizard which has three kind of subspecies in that particular species so there's a orange throat one which is very aggressive and it, uh, it covers a very large territory so it may mate with a large number of females there's a yellow throat one which is a non not a very aggressive one and that lizard uh, mimics uh, so this particular lizard lives in uh, some part of north america the uh, yellow throat one uh, mimics a female and tries to kind of sneaks into the orange throat lizard's territory and tries to mate with the females there. So it kind of, it pretends it's a female and tries to invade that territory. Blue throat uh, one, uh, so it, it is monogamous. It's, it always mates with only one female and very closely guards that particular female. So, but the blue throat one cannot defend against the orange throat one, but it can fend off the yellow throat one. Right? So these three lizards have three different mating strategies. And these, these uh, rocks, uh, rock scissors, paper game, I think all of you may be familiar as, I mean, I think as kids also, we may, have, we may have played this game. So each strategy is kind of has a, has a vulnerability against one other strategy. So using that game, you can explain how uh, these three subspecies remain at an equilibrium right because one even one species size becomes bigger the other one will try to take advantage and you know it, then it becomes uh, gets into a balance so that that kind of uh, that kind of uh, thing so it's mainly like basic science right uh, you can um, explain certain biological phenomena uh, by applying this game theoretic principles and i i came across this uh, another presentation called uh, which is relevant in the current context as well called pathogen evolution in a vaccinated world. Uh, it's, uh, I will, uh, uh, I think possible, I will share these slides. Uh, so there are actually this particular uh, scientist called Andrew Reid. It's from 2016. It's actually relevant. I, I thought it's relevant to the current context as well with the COVID vaccinations and COVID uh, going on. Because he talks about how these uh, particular uh, disease, uh, when you have multiple variants right, of a certain virus, so this Marek's disease is a very deadly disease that affects chicken. And he kind of experimentally shows that, you know, uh, when uh, uh, so. When you have these, uh, when you have a vaccinated population, the 
His argument is that the uh, more virulent variants, the deadlier variants may spread more, like uh, survive longer because the uh, vaccinated individuals will act as carriers, right? If, it, if they are not vaccinated, they will die or they will be bedridden very quickly. So they don't really spread, right? So, so it's like a very controversial idea, but he has shown, he shows here using some experiments on chicken. Uh, Uh, on chicken that when, when you vaccinate uh, a certain population, then the unvaccinated may have a higher chance of dying uh, because uh, they get exposed to the more virulent variants because through the vaccinated people, the, the deadlier variant spread more because the variants are also competing, right? So they are like in, engaged in a, in a competitive game. And uh, so it's kind of a controversial idea, I think. This was uh, published in 2016, prior to COVID. I just thought uh, it was it could be an interesting thing, and uh, so it, like that you can explain, try to explain certain things in nature, <coughs> or uh, certain human interventions as well, uh, using these. Uh, so it, you can see that it's it's go, it has gone far beyond economics or microeconomics. It has been applied. Uh, it can be applied in many different contexts because in any uh, so there can be many situations where you have these uh, strategic games right so the idea of evolutionary game game is that you have a population then you have certain rules and then uh, then those rules get or strategies get replicated you might adapt your neighbor's rules and so there's so sort of a social evolution aspect as well. So that's a different uh, uh, branch that of uh, biology that has resulted from the adoption adoption of uh, game theory. Okay, so I think we don't have much time. Anyway, now only we are actually coming to our topic. So I'll try to quickly cover these, um, at least some of these ideas. Now, when you try to apply game theory to technology, uh, of course, you, whenever you have a, a strategic decision-making scenario, you can apply game theory. So one, one good example is network routing, where you, uh, you know, uh, if you take a wireless sensor network or something, so each node is trying to preserve their power, right? Because they don't have much battery power. So a packet, data packet coming to that node, you can think of it as a gain. If you are routing a packet to another node, you are just lose, using your power for some other's benefit. So if all the nodes are completely self-interested, but they can't stop routing as well because if everybody does that, there's no communication, right? So there has to be some kind of equilibrium. So things like that have been used, uh, you know, game theory. If you look at network routing, wireless, search for research papers on uh, wireless communication, wireless, uh, sensor network routing and so on. There are many, many applications of game theoretic models. And some of these things can be very mathematical as well, but the basic principles are, are the same. And even in TCP, I mean, in uh, when you use the internet or TCP protocol, there's something called, I think all of you, or most of you may have heard of TCP back off. That is when there's a collision, each each node will try, to, will wait a random amount of time so that's also is, is based on a game theoretic principle. It's called the TCP back off game. So there are there are well-known applications where whenever you have a, a strategic decision making scenario. Or auctions can be another thought of another example. So auction in theory is actually uh, it's also a branch of game theory. I guess uh, it can be thought of as extensive form game. So the uh, person. Uh, who is doing the auction is, is making their, making the, uh, they, they publish their uh, uh, options and you can bid. So that is, that happens afterwards, <laughs> right? So Google AdWords or the Telecommunication Commission uh, Spectrum Auctioning. So all these things, uh, all in all these situations, we can use auctioning theory, which is a branch of game theory to maximize the returns. So this is another area. It's just uh, a textbook that I came across in uh, Amazon. 
So somebody has written a book on uh, autonomous system guidance in in uh, missiles. As basically in autonomous systems, because in autonomous system it has to make certain decisions, strategic decisions, right? Uh, and you can you can so again you have to make decisions based on if you, if it is a target seeking missile, if your target is moving, then you have to then your decision is affected by that, right? <clears throat> So, so it's called uh, somebody has written this book differential game theory i think they are using differential equations because rather than using these uh these constant payoffs these could be functions right where if you think of a, a missile then it has it's uh operating in a very complex environment there's varying wind speeds and then so on so uh, your mass is also changing when you're burning out fuel. So that's, uh, that's why it's called differential game theory, I guess. And this is another popular example. So some of you who are familiar with machine learning might uh, remember uh, GANs or generative adversarial networks <clears throat> where it uses these uh, two competing neural networks, one called an, a generator, another called discriminator. So so yeah, if you are generating phases, so this is used to generate new data. If you are generating phases, you can use an existing data set and try to, uh, so the discriminator is, is trying to detect the fake images from the real images and generator is generating new data. Right? So, so initially the discriminator uh, generator will be quite, uh, you know, it may not work very well, but over time it will improve. And when it, at the optimal situation at the Nash equilibrium, the discriminator will have a hard time uh, detecting which is the real phase or which is the artificial phase, right? So this, so this kind of uh, uh, things have been uh, done quite successfully now. You may have seen this, this uh, progressive GAN is this type of GAN that is used to generate these uh, uh, celebrity faces, right? These, uh, so use some real faces to uh, generate these. Uh, yeah, these are these are artificial faces generated by this kind of a GAN, which are based on real world celebrity faces, but these are not real world people, right? So uh, you may have seen these, some of these movies that uses this technology called deep fake that tries to generate uh, you know uh, artificial videos and, and all that so that uh, uh, these are the generated first what we saw was real ones so these are the generated ones so we can't we can't as humans we can't see any difference right they look as as um, as good as uh, real faces so this kind of thing things are, are can be done using GANs and GANs use this minimax game, uh, minimax games to, to do that, right? So that's also an application of games, game theory in machine learning. So game theory, you can, can think of it as a part of traditional AI, but machine learning is a more recent branch of AI. And also you can apply these in uh, reinforcement learning uh, with, in combination with reinforcement learning. So. That's also a branch of machine learning where you try to model an agent which is interacting with the environment and based on the reward, it will update its behavior. So, uh, so you, can, you can try to uh, combine uh, game theory with reinforcement learning where, uh, for instance, if we take this particular example, suppose you have an autonomous vehicle and and the autonomous vehicle is trying to overtake uh, another vehicle. Now, we, as humans, when we are overtaking, we, we have a certain, uh, we have to gauge the, uh, so sorry about that. Uh, we have to uh, guess whether the uh, person that we are overtaking is an aggressive driver or a non-aggressive driver. Right? Because depending on that, our, uh, uh, we may not overtake if it is aggressive driver. <laughs> Because when we are overtaking, they might speed up, and it might we might be in trouble. So, so this kind of uh, we can 
uh, guess the behavior of the agent using what you call a Bayesian game, and then uh, we have we can um, uh, select a certain uh, strategy based on the payoffs. Now you can apply something like uh, machine learning or, or reinforcement learning to learn these uh, prior probabilities. Right. That's why I mean, if you take a driver that is very experienced versus someone who just got the uh, license. The experienced driver, just by looking at a vehicle, he knows, okay, this person looks like an aggressive driver. So because, because of the prior prior experience, right? So same thing, you can try to do it uh, with the computer using uh, uh, something like reinforcement learning. Right? So there, are, there may be uh, applications like that. Uh, you can combine the ideas of game theory and, and machine learning, right? So those are some of the examples that I, I uh, thought of discussing. Uh, I guess we are, uh, time is almost up. Uh, so basic idea uh, that I want to highlight is that it's, so game theory uh, traditionally emerged in microeconomics as a, as a way of, uh, you know, uh, modeling strategic decision-making scenarios and maybe to compute the equilibria, equilibria and uh, maybe to understand how these decision making scenarios better and what each agent would do in a, in a uh, situation like that. Uh, and we can apply it in, in, uh, in technological, uh, in, in um, solving technology related problems. Whenever we, we encounter uh, uh, strategic decision making scenarios, because there are ample scenarios like that. If you take, take for example, cloud computing, uh, so how to allocate cloud resources from a cloud service provider's point of view, right? And there may be enough enough number of research papers on that, how people have used game theory for that, like that. And uh, in uh, wireless communications, so I'm not very familiar with wireless communication, but I know that there are many, there's a lot of literature on, on wireless communications, even our normal uh, Wi-Fi uh, net, net, networks use these ideas because they, they use this uh, technology called MIMO, multiple input, multiple output uh, antennas or receivers that, that compete for the same bandwidth, right? So these, these ideas are applied heavily in uh, technology related domains. And there may be more applications in, in, uh, in your day-to-day -day life or in your, uh, when you do uh, your work uh, in, in your respective industries also you may come across those uh, situations. So even though it's a very mature and old field, it's almost, I guess, 100 years old and there's a huge body of literature. It's not a very hot area like machine learning, I guess, or deep learning, but there may be still uh, uh, relevant applications uh, of it. So yeah, with that, I'd like to uh, conclude if you have any comments or... Uh, Questions. Uh, we tried. I don't know whether we have enough time because I have taken uh, the entire hour. Yeah. Thank yeah, you very much, Dr. You... Darshana. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for conducting a valuable session, and hope we can discuss more on this and many other interesting topics in the future with you. And uh, thank you for the audience for participating. And if you miss any section in the presentation, uh, we'll be posting the recording in Spot.lk. So in the meantime, you can check out spot.lk as well, which uh, we introduced, which is the AI powered human capital management tool. And I have a few announcements to make. So the recording is one thing and it's regarding the next webinar. So we're going to have the next webinar about uh, talent selection and enabling inclusive performance culture at work by Mr. Gihan Suarez. So I will send the invitation to all of you who participated in this. So if you don't have any questions, we can wind up the meeting. And thank you very much for joining. Have a nice day.